Ladies and gentlemen, if anybody in the room is not currently reading David Stockman, you should be. Uh, of course, you, as, as some of you probably remember he was director of OMB under Reagan. He was a congressman prior to that. But far more importantly, from my perspective anyway, is that he wrote what I think is one of the most important financial books ever written, and certainly the, the most f important financial book of the 21st century called The Great Deformation, which not only explains the crash of 2008, but also explains uh, so much about central banking and how it finances all kinds of evil in the decades prior. Uh, he has a new book out called Trumped, which somebody needs to get to Trump uh, and have him read it ASAP, because I'm afraid without that, um, we are going to be lost in some kind of a cataclysm of, uh, of spending. But uh, David Stockman uh, runs a website called Contra Corner. He is an absolute tireless uh, writer uh, against crony capitalism, and I think uh, he's one of the leading lights in our movement today. Thanks so much, David Stockman. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much for that warm welcome. It's the first time anybody's applauded since way back in 1985 when they ran me out of Washington on a rail uh, in the Reagan administration. But I really want to give my uh, sincere appreciation to Jeff for saying a good thing about my book, The Great Deformation, because uh, when it came out in uh, 2013, it was denounced by every point on the political compass, the Republicans and the Democrats and the liberals and the conservatives, and Wall Street hated it, and the military-industrial complex found it offensive, and it got denounced wildly, loudly by the neocons in the Congress, and the social cons, and the tax cons, and the just cons, which uh, is about everybody else uh, left there. But uh, I expected it to some degree because I said, you know, the book is saying we're heading to a terrible dystopia where the Fed is destroying capitalism, where Imperial Washington is wrecking the world with all its interventions, where we're going uh, bankrupt because of this government that can't stop spending and borrowing. So I expected uh, some f uh, uh, blowback, let's call it. But, you know, I thought at one point, uh, one of the critics went way over the top, and that was your friend, Professor Paul Krugman, who uh, the day the book came out, wrote a blog called The Rantings of a Cranky Old Man. Uh, and that was uh, what he had to say about my book. But, you know, that was going so far that it even aroused my 88-year-old mother, uh, who, upon reading his blog, shot me an email saying, doesn't he know? Uh, you were a cranky young man, too. <laughs> and uh, the point is that I think there are a lot of cranky people in America uh, who responded to what I had to say because within one day after that cranky old man blog, my book, and I'm not bragging here, went to number four on the Amazon bestseller list, and the only thing ahead of it was two diet books uh, and uh, something a novel, a horror novel called The Walking Dead. So uh, I thought, uh, well, maybe there is an audience out there, uh, but the uh, true uh, uh, point of the matter is that uh, it did end up number three on the New York Times bestseller list, and again, I'm not bragging, because after three years, they're still debating at the New York Times whether, Times whether that was number three on the fiction or the nonfiction uh, category. Uh, but in any event, uh, I'm very happy to be here, uh, to be part of this conference on war and peace. I think we're on the war part today, uh, at least as a result of the events of the last uh, couple of days. But uh, I do want to give just a quick update, Jeff, on your uh, point about the general getting all hot and bothered about the tomahawks. Here's the news flash on the tomahawks. They fired 59. 36 of them were duds that landed in the desert somewhere. 23 hit the airfields. None of them hit the runway. They're launching sorties today from the runway uh, that we didn't hit. Not a single operable plane was taken out. What they did hit was three butler buildings, uh, otherwise known as hangars, and a graveyard for inoperable planes that have been sitting there for the last uh, who knows how long. So the point is, this was kind of a random, crazy thing. Where did it come from? Two days, uh, no investigation possible, plenty of circumstantial 
reasons to think uh, that this was a false flag, very much like what happened back in August 2013. Everybody's forgot about that, uh, the GOTA event, so-called. Uh, but when you go back and look at what some of the uh, objective uh, evidence is, uh, investigations today, it's pretty clear that it wasn't launched by the regime. It was launched by local jihadist radicals who are trying to bait Obama in to doing exactly what Trump did uh, two days ago uh, when he had foolishly put out that uh, red line. Um, I also uh, want to, before we get into the main uh, topic, want to welcome everyone. I was delighted to hear that there are people here from Mexico and Canada. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll come back next year, even if you have to leap the wall uh, when the thing uh, actually gets built. Uh, Jeff had a very good observation about the think tanks, which just have proliferated everywhere in Washington, and I'm going to talk about that. They all say the same thing. Uh, I turned on cable news uh, Thursday night, and you couldn't find anything from uh, MSNBC to CNN to Fox that said anything different. There are all these generals, all these consultants, all these think tank experts, all these uh, ex uh, you know National Security Council types, all saying the same thing. They were in war heat. And so it reminds me today, Jeff, that really you don't have a whole bunch of think tanks around Washington. You have a whole bunch of group think uh, tanks. They all think the same thing because they're all paid by the same paymaster, which I call the warfare state. In a moment, we'll get into some of the detail, but it's a trillion dollar monster that basically feeds the prosperity of the Beltway. That's why I call it the Imperial City. And everything in the imperial city today is compromised, but most especially the news media. I was just struck, to tell you the truth. Uh, I was appalled when I heard the great guru, you know, uh, in the pecking order of things, there are some people that are felt to be the real uh, thoughtful leaders of uh, the uh, media today. One of them is Fareed Zakaria. And when I heard him say on CNN Thursday night, as they were showing in the background all the flashing from the bombs hitting and so forth, that tonight Donald Trump became president because he was foolish and rash enough to launch an unconstitutional, illegal, unnecessary, pointless attack on an airfield in Syria, it sort of uh, brought it all together and told me really what we're up against and why things like what Ron Paul is doing and what Mises is doing is so critically important because there is a totally different view on what's going on in the world if you get your lens right and if you're not part of this overwhelming group think consensus that is literally suffocating the machinery of government, the machinery of the mainstream media uh, in uh, Washington today. And that's why we're at this uh, point, uh, I think, that we're at. I also wanted, before I uh, get into a little more substance, I want to acknowledge how uh, much I admire and how grateful I am for all the work in behalf of the cause of peace. And that's really what it is that Ron Paul has done over so many decades, I consider him really a national treasure, a person that I've admired for the last 40 years since we both sat together in the Congress in 1978. And the interesting thing about that is that we were both kind of free market, rabid free market types, and uh, we sat way in the back benches and we were being totally ignored by everyone because they thought that uh, what we were, uh, uh, you know, focused on entirely uh, was the free market. But actually, uh, we were working on an issue that is the issue of the day. Uh, Ron was really, a, at that point, a closet peacenik. And little did they understand that I was a 30-year-old congressman at the time, and 10 years earlier, I'd been out on the barricades as a member of SDS protesting the war in Vietnam, and really trying to disrupt uh, the machine, and we've been going in the wrong direction ever since. And here we are today, 
And uh, I'm, uh, you know, more convinced than ever that what we were saying uh, about the aggressive, uh, expansionist, interventionist foreign policy then, in 1968, that led to the folly of Vietnam uh, is even more true today. And that's why history, I think, is so important, perspective. I, a lot of you probably travel, if you've ever been to Vietnam, you have to go to Hanoi uh, if you're traveling to Southeast Asia, or go to Sa uh, Saigon, and ask yourself, what in the hell were we doing putting 500,000 young Americans, billions of dollars, dropping on the country from one end to the other, napalm and every other kind of horrible thing out of the sky. Why were we doing that back in 1960s? What was the point? There is no trace of anything accomplished, any purpose, any valid uh, uh, objective uh, for uh, 50 years later. In fact, uh, Vietnam is now becoming uh, a major supplier of goods and services to the United States. So um, uh, I just uh, think that maybe we need to have a little perspective, historical perspective, and I have to say that in light of the event two days ago, I had to change uh, the title of my speech. It orig originally was the Deep State and the Donald, and my, the whole idea was that, in, in some ways, he was a victim already of the deep state. They were trying to relitigate the election. Uh, that's what all of this uh, Russiagate uh, hysteria is about. And I thought, they're not going to win, even if they wound and undermine him badly and even destroy his presidency, because at least he's an impetuous bomb thrower that would uh, help to begin to, uh, let's, what the word I used was discredit and unmask this huge uh, surveillance state uh, that uh, has uh, grown up in the hysteria after 9-11. Uh, well, little did I know that <laughs> suddenly uh, Donald Trump has been taken hostage by the deep state. <laughs> and uh, before uh, we knew it, uh, he's uh, ending up being the tool of the deep state, and that's uh, really the topic that I want to address today. How did this happen? How did it happen so fast that in a few days that a president that they were literally after attempting to drive from the very Oval Office, how did it end up that he did uh, the, uh, undertook the act that was so uh, rash, uh, so uncalled for, uh, even after, by the way, everybody's familiar with all the tweets that he put out in 2013 when Obama was on the brink after the false flag attack in uh, uh, August. You read all of them, don't do it. How can you get involved in a civil war when there are two sides and you want to fight both of them? It's none of our business. They haven't attacked us. There is no possible danger. The only thing you could do is compound and exacerbate the most complex sectarian uh, battle, uh, uh, conflict, civil war that we've ever seen. So he was right then. He was right last week when he sent his Secretary of State out to say, you know, uh, regime change is done. That was one of the fundamental propositions of his campaign. Regime change doesn't work. That's not our role, obviously. Uh, and so what? Uh, here we are. In three days, the regime change is behind, uh, thrown overboard. Uh, he had his, even his uh, neocon, uh, uh, you know, uh, ambassador to the UN saying the same thing. And I, since Nikki Haley basically reads out of the playbook that Samantha Powers left behind from the uh, Obama administration, I'm sure it was tough for her to get out the words that uh, we're not going to. We've decided that not to take Assad out. But now here we are, and everything has changed, and he's back in the groove. So the question that I asked to myself was, well, what is the purpose of this attack after two days, no investigation of what really happened in Idlib province in that little uh, uh, town uh, where obviously it looks like they hit a, a ammo dump, and there could have well been, and there's plenty of... Uh, uh, suggestions that there were both regular ammunition and chemical weapons being stored there. 
But what was he possibly trying to accomplish if it's not regime change, if it's not taking out the entire uh, uh, Air Force and Army of the Syrians? What is he trying to accomplish? And the only thing that I can think of is that, and they've said it, um, Assad had to be punished. And so, uh, you know, the question comes to your mind, who appointed Donald Trump to be the global spanker in chief for any uh, dictator or uh, leader of a country that misbehaves? And that is not a basis for a, for a foreign policy. That's not a valid basis for attacking any country. And if you want to be spanker in chief, why don't you take a look at the leader of Egypt who was in the Oval Office a week or two ago. He's, he's murdered thousands of his political opponents uh, since he illegally uh, took power in a coup several years ago. If you uh, want to be spanker in chief, and compel behavior, and this is the thing that uh, Fareed Zakaria was saying, finally, the president has realized that there are standards in the world and it's the job of the United States to enforce those standards, and if occasionally we have to use military power, let's do it. He was applauding that, well, then where are the standards in this horrendous civil war that's going on in Yemen? Uh, we are arming the Saudis with every kind of destructive device, bomb, missile, drone that there is. Uh, they wouldn't have the firepower that they do without all this U.S. supplied uh, munitions. So far, 10,000 civilians have been casualties, 4,000 killed, men, women, and children, weddings, and all the rest of it, 6,000 injured many of them from cluster bombs which are supplied by Textron to the Saudi government that is using it on the civilian population of Yemen. So if you want to be the spanker in chief, bring in the king of Saudi Arabia and uh, you know, uh, <laughs> give him a, a whack or two. The point is it makes no sense. There's no justification for it. And yet, that's about the only thing that I can think of uh, that uh, Donald Trump may be up to. So uh, the question that I want to uh, kind of try to answer a little bit is how in 77 days did this outlaw, renegade, uh, guy who said a few things in the campaign that made sense, like let's make a deal with Putin, we don't have to have a, ba a war with Putin, Let's get out of the Middle East. Regime change has been a disaster. We've got rubble and destroyed states and millions of refugees and blowback of every time everywhere. He said all this. How in 77 days is he doing something as stupid, as immoral, as short-sighted, as impulsive as uh, starting a, a major conflict uh, uh, with the Assad government and getting exactly into harm's way with Russia and all of its allies that are on the ground there, the Iranians, uh, Hezbollah, and all the rest of them. How did this happen in 77 days? And I think what I would like to do is suggest that the deep state or the warfare state or whatever you want to call it has gotten so massive, the indu military, industrial, congressional, surveillance complex, and so forth, that it envelops everything that enters the imperial city, that enters the White House, the Oval Office, and therefore the kind of challenge and problem and threat, really, that we face from this thing uh, is far greater than almost anybody could imagine if they could even take down uh, Donald Trump uh, within such a short period of time. Now let's just say how big it is. I call it the trillion dollar monster. And that's because if you take the 600 billion that's uh, admitted to in the defense budget, you add about 50 billion for your security assistance and foreign aid and all the rest of it. You add another 70 billion that goes into uh, homeland security and an extension of uh, the uh, warfare state uh, at home. 180 billion for um, 
uh, veterans, and after all, we have, we're spending $180 billion on veterans because we've had all these wars since Vietnam, since uh, the last 50 years, that have been pointless, and we've ended up with all of these young uh, men and women who uh, need uh, uh, medical care or compensation or pensions and so forth. None of that uh, ever should have happened, so charge it uh, to the warfare state. Uh, add a little bit of carry cost for the debt, which is now 20 billion, and you got a trillion dollar monster with funds flowing in every direction. And especially in the imperial city, you have a 75 billion complex of, for the 17 agencies of the intelligence community. Now the difference between what I call the intelligence complex and the old uh, fashioned notion of the military industrial is that at least the military industrial complex was spread all over the world and spread all over the country. We had bases all over the country, defense contractors all over, uh, 200,000 forces abroad that shouldn't be there and so forth. But when you get to the intelligence community, it is concentrated, massed in the greater metropolitan area of DC. I think there's two or three or 400,000 contractors or direct employees. If you take the 75 billion budget of, C of the CIA and NASA and all the rest of them, uh, 50 billion of it goes to contracts. And so you have all these huge contracting companies that are paying people big, big salaries, not GS 16 or 18 salaries, but huge salaries. You create that entire uh, mass uh, concentration of people all needing a justification for a continuation of the flow of all this money. That's why when you go into Washington, I don't go to Washington that much uh, anymore, Congressman, but when I do, compared to where, what I saw when I started there in 1970 or even when I left in 1985, the prosperity is amazing. And you say to yourself, where is all this prosperity, this glass and steel and all these new hotels and restaurants and all of this uh, you know, uh, uh, fancy stuff coming from in a city that has no manufacturing, has no industry. Where does it come from? It's coming from the $75 billion intelligence complex that sprawled all over the entire metro area. So uh, part of that, obviously, is the group think tanks. Part of that is the media that's housed there. I mean, Wolf Blitzer, can you stand to listen to another night of Wolf Blitzer drooling over, uh, you know, the next uh, 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 occupation or intervention or uh, stage of the war? They're all down there embedded in that uh, horrible environment that's been created. Now, my point is that if there were some kind of existential threat to the very future of our society, of our democracy, of our system, some horrible, immense, powerful, uh, terminal threat uh, to our existence, uh, maybe that would be a justification for what we have. But I want to spend a couple minutes telling you that the real secret, and we need to get it out and sort of preach the gospel, is we have no serious industrial, technological, military threat anywhere on the planet. Instead of an existential threat, we have less of a threat than we've had since 1917 when Wilson foolishly put us into the First World War. Uh, and let's just uh, tick off what is out there. Uh, the first one, obviously, is Russia. And you know, that's a joke. R if they're going to land on the shores of New Jersey, they would need vast power project projection capability. Uh, aircraft carriers and suites of uh, capacity uh, to land. I, I know I'm being facetious, but the point is, none of that is remotely possible because they've got one 50-year-old, aging, smoke-belching aircraft carrier that's on duty in the eastern Mediterranean and probably couldn't get out of the Straits of Gibraltar if it had to. That's it. So how do they threaten the security or the safety of anybody in America unless you think Putin, who is the ultimate chess player, the cool hand Luke, of the global uh, you know, scene today is foolish enough to risk uh, nuclear retaliation 
by uh, attacking us first uh, and have all of Russia turned into a parking lot. It, the point is, we have had the nuclear deterrent on our uh, submarine, uh, Trident submarines, more than enough ever since I was there fighting the defense buildup in 1980. We don't need any more money. There's nothing that the Russians are going to do that remotely threatens us. And as a matter of fact, just to give you some feel for how silly this whole damn thing is. I actually uh, am fortunate enough to live in New York City and uh, on the 19th floor of a very nice apartment building on the East River. And when I look out from my balcony, I can see the Queens on the other side and I look south and I can see Brooklyn. I look north on one side, there's Harlem and on another side, uh, there's the Bronx. And also I can see the entirety of Russia from the balcony of my apartment in New York City. Now, I'm not doing a Sarah Palin on you, okay? I'm not talking about the Siberian landmass. I'm talking about the fact that the GDP that I can see from my balcony of New York metro area is 1.6 trillion and the GDP of Russia is 1.3 trillion. In other words, uh, they're, they're, the entire economy of Russia is not even as big as New York City. It's one-seventh of the uh, GDP of the United States. Russia is mainly a huge hydrocarbon field uh, with a few uh, nickel mines, 100 million acres of uh, wheat, and an aging workforce that has a great fondness for vodka and other distractions. So the point is there is nothing there that could ever generate a threat or the military capability uh, to uh, uh, harm us. Now, China is the same thing. Uh, you know, if you think about it, do you really worry at night that China is going to send uh, some missiles or a fleet of aircraft to over, uh, to over the Pacific in order to bomb 4,000 Walmarts in America? I mean, the point is their economy would collapse within six months if they didn't have this global, bloated global system of exports and trade. That's what the whole Red Ponzi is predicated upon. And uh, if they want to build sandcastles in the South China Sea, more power to them. Uh, but they aren't a threat to us, and frankly, they're not a threat to any of their neighbors either because they depend on a huge supply of raw materials coming up uh, through the South China Sea into their ports and uh, all the intermediate products that come uh, you know, from all the nearby countries like South Korea, Taiwan, Malaysia, and so forth. Now, my point today is can't we learn a lesson from the demise of the, uh, of the Soviet Union in the 80s? You know, one of the things I had to do over and over when I was in the budget office was fight this massive buildup of defense uh, spending that uh, Reagan got convinced to do. When the Soviet Union was dying on its own accord because it was predicated on a centralized socialist controlled uh, economy that was falling apart. And the only thing we really needed to do was just wait it out, and sure enough, it did. It wasn't the Reagan buildup. It wasn't Star Wars. All the money that went into that Reagan buildup ended up, ironically, going into conventional weapons. Uh, it didn't go into uh, strategic defense. It didn't go into strategic offense. It went into uh, uh, tanks, and it went into a 600-ship navy and more aircraft carriers and uh, more, uh, you know, uh, uh, cruise uh, missiles and tomahawks and so forth. All the things that subsequently got used for the uh, wars of invasion and occupation that we never uh, should have undertaken. But my point is, let's learn from that mistake and realize that uh, China is a red ponzi of historic uh, proportion, that 20 years ago, the debt of all of China was a half trillion dollars. Today, it's 30 trillion. That you don't blow up the debt of a system by 60-fold, 60 60x, in two decades, 
and create a frenzy of building and speculating and borrowing and uh, 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 gambling, really, and expect the system to be stable, sustainable, when there are no market mechanisms to discipline it, or there's no honesty in the system since they all lie up and down uh, the channel. So my point is, we only need to wait it out. We don't have to get excited about the China threat either. And frankly, we don't have to get that excited about the terrorism threat either. And if we wanted to do something about it, that's the third item, we ought to stop bombing and droning and occupying because it's the blowback from that that's created what is, what does exist today uh, as, uh, as a terrorist threat. And I think all of you know that because all you have to do is ask yourself, before 1990, how many terrorist incidents do you, rec do you remember? Not many, and most of them had to do with intermurals between the Palestinians and the Israelis. It had nothing to do with us. It had nothing to do with uh, 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 Europe. And all of a sudden, allegedly, we're more in peril than ever before in history. Well, where did all this come from? It started with Gulf War I. What in the world were we doing trying to argue, uh, uh, resolve or intervene in a fight between the emir of Kuwait, who was directionally drilling into Saddam's oil field, and Saddam was pissed off, and pretty soon he decided to take over the oil field. And the next thing we knew, George uh, Bush said, this will not stand. We had 500,000 uh, troops uh, on the sands of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the uh, Mujahideen that we had armed and trained to fight the Soviets became offended because we were uh, you know, we were uh, uh, defacing uh, the holy lands, and the next thing we knew, uh, we ended up where we are today. But the point is, stop the intervention. The blowback will die out. The threat will eventually disappear. But beyond that, they're not coming over here anyway. And I just have to get this point across. I, I had it in, in my book that I wrote on Trump. Uh, and that is, uh, I got very upset during the campaign when he was talking about terrorists everywhere, lurking behind every bush, so I went and checked it out. And it turns out, if you take this time frame, which is 15 years, between 9-11 and that last unfortunate incident from the, done by the lone wolves in San Bernardino, which I think was December uh, 2014, 15, in that period, 420 Americans were killed by lightning, okay? And six Americans, civilians, were killed by terrorist acts outside of military bases. So that gives you a little bit of perspective about the fact that 99.9% .9 of the American people in the towns and cities and villages and farms of America are not imperiled by terrorists. And this, this huge, massive uh, system that we've created to combat them uh, is uh, part of the problem, not part of the solution. And, uh, you know, so it leads to uh, uh, the system to keep itself alive leads to uh, what I call endless false narratives, because if there isn't an enemy, if there isn't an imminent threat, uh, if there isn't danger lurking everywhere, even if it's uh, more from lightning than it is from terrorists, then over time it becomes hard to justify all of this money uh, that is being uh, wasted in this massive system. Uh, you know, I want to mention one or two, because this is one of the things I do in my blog, and I think it's important that we educate people about what is taken for granted as truths uh, in the day-to-day uh, -day mainstream media, it, uh, which is totally distorting of the facts and is creating a false case for this massive system that led Donald Trump uh, to try to bomb an airfield, uh, which uh, even that didn't happen. You know, one of them is Russia is an expansionist power, and if they can't get to the New Jersey shores, they're going to take over all of Europe. Uh, and how do we know that? Well, because allegedly they occupied Crimea. All right, now here are the facts on Crimea. Catherine the Great bought Crimea for hard gold money in 1783 from the Turks, uh, who were desperate for cash. 
It was a stalwart part of Russia for 200 years. Uh, Sevastopol, the main port, became the home port for the Black Sea Fleet, the heart of the Russian Navy under czars and commissars alike. And it was not until 1956, after being in the heart of the Russian Empire, in fact, uh, you know, the charge of the Light Brigade occurred in uh, Crimea, and it was the occupying invaders who were charging the English, and it was the Russian patriots who were defending uh, the homeland. Uh, that's uh, the, the, the point. But it wasn't until 1956, after the succession of Stalin was resolved and Khrushchev had killed off his two res uh, rivals. And Khrushchev, as you remember, was a Ukrainian, so in a night of drunken celebration with his comrades from Kiev and the Ukraine, they decided they would transfer in the Soviet Empire Crimea from Russia to the Ukraine. That's how it happens. So we're supposed to start a war today in order to compel Russia to return Crimea because uh, of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a uh, invasion uh, that we helped, uh, or a coup that we helped uh, as, uh, uh, start in uh, uh, 2014. Uh, my point is, uh, Crimea has been part of uh, Russia and provided them with a warm water port for 173 years which is longer than California has been part of the United States when we got our warm water port, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in California. Uh, the point is there are a lot of these uh, that we could talk about. Uh, one other that I just want to mention, and then I'll take some questions, is, um, you know, we're constantly being told that they need these billions of dollars to do the policing on the homeland, all this homeland security stuff, because there are terror cells everywhere. But I think, uh, Congressman, you've probably looked at this, but the fact is that about 90% of these so-called busts of terror cells are FBI stings. And one of my great, uh, anyone who wants to get educated on the terrorist threat needs to only go back and watch Paul Newman and Robert Redford's movie of 40 years ago called The Sting, and you will see exactly what's going on today. But most of them are sting operations, and the latest one was, uh, and I just mentioned this in closing, the latest one was in Kansas City, where the FBI agents cultivated for several weeks a young man who uh, was so destitute, so out of it, such a loser, uh, who uh, his wife had left him and had a young son, that the FBI gave, had to give him $30 and babysit his son <clears throat> while he went to Walmart to buy a list of stuff that they had given him, like copper wires and battery and <laughs> batteries and fertilizer and a few other incriminating things. Now, this may be an extreme case, but the point is this is part of what I call uh, this false narrative that's constantly going on. So um, the uh, bottom line, I guess, of my point today is that maybe there's a silver lining in this latest uh, uh, capture of Trump uh, by the deep state, this utterly stupid uh, attack on Syria. And that is maybe it will help revive a coalition, uh, anti-war coalition in the Congress like the one that I started with way back in 1968 when uh, both non-interventionists like Senator Aiken from Vermont and uh, uh, real uh, uh, doves from the Democrat uh, side came together and basically put Johnson out of business, stopped the war, and ended the madness. Maybe now the, the liberals and the uh, so-called progressives will come back to life. I mean, they've been... Uh, essentially uh, sidelined during the whole Obama era because anything he did they had to justify. But if we uh, have an opportunity now to tell Trump that you can't do this without congressional authorization and a real debate begins in Congress, which I think is beginning to happen, maybe we can uh, revive some kind of resistance, some kind of opposition 
to the madness uh, that's been going on. And I, in this uh, setting, I want to particularly commend Rand Paul for the tremendous leadership, uh, the astute and brilliant uh, 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 you know, representation of this position that he's doing day after day in the Senate. And he goes on the media and he just leaves them totally flamoxed because he, in a calm way, is laying out the facts of the case. And uh, so I consider uh, Rand, just like uh, his father, to be one of the great uh, patriots of America. In fact, uh, to sum it up, when you think of what Rand is willing to do uh, to defend the Constitution and the, ro the right way uh, for the foreign policy to be conducted, to defend the position of uh, non-intervention and a more uh, peaceful foreign policy, he is willing to go so far as that I read this morning that he's trying to form a coalition uh, yeah, for uh, bringing this to the Senate floor with Senator Pocahontas from Massachusetts. And uh, that, I, I would say, that's going uh, a mile and beyond. So uh, at least there's some glimmerings of hope, uh, but uh, frankly, the group think is killing us. The warfare state is uh, suffocating uh, Washington. Uh, the war machine is bankrupting and draining the fiscal and economic resources of America, and the hour is getting late. So uh, maybe there's a chance to turn it around, and maybe uh, inadvertently Donald Trump gave us that opportunity two days ago. Thank you very much. <laughs>